would go out in teams to go out into these bars and we split up and we take some our Filipina staff and some our girls, some of our girls that are come from the bars. They go back into these bars. Oh, it's amazing. And they love going back in. And in their words, they say, I want to go back and get my sisters. Well, welcome to the show today, folks. We have a very special guest, uh, the CEO, the founder of Wipe Every Tears. It's a ministry based in the Philippines that rescues girls out of sex trafficking. Uh, Kenny Sachs is with us. So um, welcome to the show today, Kenny. Hi, Ken. Uh, it's really good to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, let's, let's get a little bit, I'm, you know, I want to just dive right in, but let's get some background on you. I, I'm raring to go to talk about the ministry, but tell us a little bit about uh, Kenny. Oh, gosh. Well, Kenny is happily married, a wonderful bride, DA, and I have six children, 15 grandchildren, and uh, so I'm very happy there. And, you know, I graduated from college and uh, went to seminary, graduated from seminary and uh pastored and then i uh we ended up moving to boise idaho we were just god was touching us in some different ways and i was just being challenged with the supernatural and about the word of god right i mean make yeah. it look like 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 it i i just craved for my life something was missing uh you know as i was in seminary i'd be reading you know studying my theology and you understand that, you know, you, yes. you, you're, you're in the seminary process right now, Ken. Yeah. And I would sit there and I'd just be taken with, in fact, I, it was this Bible and it would be sitting in a little tiny desk. It'd be sitting there, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're, you're, you know, you get your Bible open, you're taking notes and, you know, you got to get all this systematic theology, you know, down. And mm -hmm. I found myself just mesmerized in the word. And I would like, I would just be lost in this and like, Oh, Oh, oh gosh. You know, and I'd look at my buddy, you know, I get, need to get the notes, right. Cause we're going to test it on that. And that's how it all started began is I just began to crave more intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I kept, I kept thinking not in addition to the blood of Christ, not in addition to the cross, but there must be more. I found myself saying there must be more. Yeah. There's yeah. gotta be more. And so uh, I went off to graduated, went off to pastor, and uh, it was a little Baptist church, population three hundred, Cove, Oregon, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful little place. And I, uh, the the deacon, elder guys, they said, "Hey, why don't we go through the Book of Acts?" Mistake, no. <laughs> or or good, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I got to Acts 1 8, and it said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Mm. And I, I was in my little office, and I it's still written in my Bible. It says, Where is the power? Mm. My man. Because I'm I'm going, I'm a believer. I'm I'm a follower of Jesus. I love him with everything i love my bride my little children i i love people i i i want to see people come to faith in jesus you know i want them to encounter the living god but i had i wrote in there i have as much power as a dandelion i didn't know what to call it it's dandelion you know the, the after it does the yellow thing it goes into the the little fluffy little things or cottonwood trees. And I wrote that in my Bible. I said, that's how powerful I feel that it just goes with the wind. It can't do it. It just, it has zero power. And Ken, I'm telling you, God, I got, I got down to the floor on my face and I have my files over here, four drawer files. And I said, Holy spirit, I know the scripture says you're my teacher. And for the first time ever, I said, I need you to be my teacher. Hmm. And I said, I give you all my notes. And I, I, and that's what I'm saying. I give you all my notes. They're in the, all those files, you know, every class, every, all, every paper, every, whatever. 
And that day began me on a journey that has been a very wild journey. And uh, I didn't fit in very well. You know, I was, I, I mean, I love the Lord. I love people. I can communicate. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I, uh, but I just didn't fit. I didn't fit the church thing very well. So after two years, I resigned, went and planted a church. That wasn't really the way it worked very well. Then we moved to Boise, Idaho. And uh, I began to encounter things. You know, we started going to a, a vineyard church. John Wimber, you know, John all that Wimber, story. Yeah. And, and all those guys, right? And Well, that was all new to me. And I, uh, I just had some, I've had two huge major encounters with God. Uh, I mean, the kind that are explosive, big, and one was in the early days there where I was pastoring. I, I was still pastoring. And, yeah, share, uh, share those with us. Okay. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine named Leo, he was he was still in seminary. You know, we, I had graduated. He was still left behind. And what, so, what seminary was he? Or, it, this... it was Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Very conservative seminary, much like Dallas would be Dallas Seminary. Yeah. And uh, so pre-iPhone uh, uh, days, pre-computer days, you know, um, he would we'd write letters back and forth. And he encountered God and he encountered Holy Spirit. And, you know, I used to hear that and go like, oh, oh so I don't have the Holy Spirit, huh? That's what, you, you know. I, right, yeah. And so anybody listening, I, I'm not one of those guys that say, you know, if you're a conservative Baptist, community church, Presbyterian, whatever you are, I'm not talking that you have anything less than I do. Mm -hmm. But I encountered this aspect of this infilling of the Holy Spirit. Like people were telling me around me and I never believed it. And I thought they're just a bunch of charismatic, wild, ridiculous, nonsensical and thinking Pentecostals. You know, and I see, and and going and rewinding back just briefly, it was it was 1976, my first year of college, Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon, and I walked in on accident, quote, to a Keith Green concert. Yes. <laughs> and Keith Green, wild, bushy hair, and he's going up and down I five, you know, the whole West Coast, and playing that piano, and he's just da 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 da. -da, -da. And I, I'm telling you, the Jesus revolution, it's true. I just, I walked in and walked out a different person and I encountered Jesus in a couple hours and boom, I was a different person. I was born again. And that's, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie Jesus Revolution, but that was me. I just didn't have the long hair hippie guy. I was the athlete guy, you know, and, and, uh, but so I encountered Jesus during the Jesus revolution. So now fast forwarding, you know, uh, my friend Leo, he's he's messaging me and he'd give me about this much. And then I'd, and I would write back about like that. And then he would go like that. And he'd go, and I'd ask these questions, which I, I felt safe asking him, you know, and he took me to Corinthians, which I had read, I don't know how many hundreds of times you've been in Corinthians. And, and all of a sudden, the same passages that I'd been reading forever totally changed. And Paul talks about praying in the spirit and praying with his mind. I'll sing with my spirit. I'll sing with my mind. And I'm going, God, I've never seen this before. I And, and, and I just started, you know, I, all the cross references, of course, to about the supernatural, the gifts. And I even hesitate even to say tongues because of because of that background that I came from. But when someone would mention tongues, I immediately just, you know, <laughs> you know. And I'm always I'm always concerned about my audience, but I'm just the scripture talks about the scripture talks about. So I'm just quoting the scriptures, right? The tongues and prophecy and words of knowledge and 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 everything that comes with that, you know, gifts, gifts, plural of healing, and and I was just asking those questions. Where are those things? I had been taught with really well intentioned, really good, loving men and women that they'd ceased and that they were done away with. 
So I, I'm, that's why I'm disciples. So I believe that. So anybody during college that was of that other ilk <laughs> is how I would explain it back then. I yeah. d- nothing to do with them, but it took the Lord taking me and my wife, and my kids into a little tiny town of 300, you know, I had to go 16 miles just to get to a grocery store. Um, and I was by myself. And I just said, oh, Holy Spirit, be my teacher. Whew. So I was traveling to Portland to do a thing. And my buddy says, hey, we're getting together on Friday night at the church. Do you want to join us? I said, sure. Little Vineyard Church. Back in the day when the vineyard was the vineyard, you know, and not that the vineyard's not the vineyard today, but you know what I mean? It was, there was such an anointing. There was such a powerful thing happening in the vineyard. It was it's it's historical, really. It's yes. it, it is going in the history books it has. of the vineyard movement and and what was taking place. And so I uh, I went to this meeting and we went into you know they rented a little little office area, you know, very small little place. You know, maybe you could put fifty or hundred people in there, maybe. And uh, we were just sitting around there. It was a Friday night, and there was like twenty of us. And there was a gal named Laura Wong, Dick and Laura Wong. Uh, they were pastors there. That was him and his wife. And she was on an acoustic guitar. And I'd never experienced this. It was back in the days when we had the uh, the Integrity Hosanna uh, cassettes. And I would secretly get those because if you were listening to those, that meant you were <laughs> that meant yeah. you were a wild person. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'd listen to those things and go, man, that's really good worship. That's really good. But I'd never experienced it live. And it wasn't with it wasn't with the band. It was just one woman. Yeah. 15, 20 people just sitting around casually singing love songs to Jesus. Man, I feel it now, kid. God is so real. You know what? I never lost, I've never lost my heart for Jesus. Even in seminary, I had so many of my friends, they lose. They just lost their passion for Jesus. Jesus became an, he became an academic exercise. That's the last thing I wanted, right? Oh, wow. You know, one thing I've always asked God is to keep me soft. So I could cry and I would feel his heart, you know, that, you know, that I would have the heart of heaven. That You know, God, help me to see what you see and hear what you hear. Feel what you feel. And would you break my heart with the things that break yours? Anyway, going back to that night, Ken, uh, they just, they just were, you know, strumming guitar and worshiping and and, you know, of course, he didn't do this. I was taught, believe it or not, that it, when you do this, it's an opening for the devil to come fill you. That was my paradigm. I was a big John MacArthur guy, which he's a wonderful teacher of the word. I still love John MacArthur so much and honor the man. Mm-hmm. But under his the pastor that I had a great guy named Bob and Sandy Johnson. They, uh, you know, it was that, it was that theology that, you know, you, that those things are not up for today. Yeah. It's cessionist, it's, cessationist theology. A cessationist theology, right. That all those things ceased during that shortly after the, the death of the last, or the last guy, the last of the 12. Mm-hmm. But that night, so there, there's people just praying and everything. All of a sudden, my my buddy just is just praying for me. I'd never been around anybody, anybody like putting their hand out. I mean, you just don't do that. And so I remember Leo's words. He said this here. He says, I'm I know we know each other very well. I know where you're at. I know you, I know your paradigm. So he's being very careful. He's already had, you know, some wonderful encounters with God. He said, I remember it, he goes, my hand, I had to hold my hand back. It was like a magnet going to you. And I thought, oh, no, he's going to think that, you know, he's going to check out. 
but he did. He, so he just, he just, and, and he didn't like plaster his head, head, head hands on me. Like he just at a distance, just, just near my shoulder, my head, you know, like this here. And within a few moments, I started to like, what am I feeling? I'm feeling something. Oh, Kenny, you're one of those feeling guys. <laughs> I'm not a, of course we have feelings. I, I root my Boise State Broncos on and I get all excited with feelings and I have feelings for my wife and I have feelings with people. I'm not ashamed of feelings. How did we ever say that we can't have feelings when it comes to the God of the universe and the lover of our souls? We're not supposed to have intimate feelings. I mean, it makes no sense, right? Right. But that paradigm, you know, you can't have feelings. Feelings overtake the mind. I go, I... anyway, then another person comes by. His his wife, Wendy, comes by. Then there was three, four, five people praying for me. And Ken, my theology was challenged that night. Like, like some people can't even imagine. And I, I'm like this here, and I'm feeling this all, what is it like when when you feel that? Like there might be people listening going, so what did you feel? And I I felt like this streams, this of love, this this blanket of love that just oh, it was so amazing. It was it was love. It was love. It was love. well, Jesus is love. I mean, so Jesus was coming. Holy Spirit was coming. Abba Father was coming to minister to His Son, His boy, who was so longing for Him. And so, so something very interesting happened that night. Here I was, a pastor. And my hands start start curling up like this. I can't control them. They start controlling up, and that's oh, that's as far as I can go right now. They were so far down that that they were they were almost touching. They were just like a, like a, a quarter of an inch from touching. How you? I mean, I don't, I don't know how that could even happen, but they were, and it was the pain was intense. And finally, I just said, guys, it hurts. It hurts. And they're just sitting around. They're going, yeah, we see that. So the pastor, Dick, he comes over and it just, it's, it, it was not wild stuff. You know, it was just, it very, John Wimber had a way about him discipling all his people, right? And we just, we just did the things, the works and words of Jesus, you know? And so he said, they started, they start asking each other. I'd never heard this stuff. Are you guys getting words of knowledge? What are you guys getting? God, get, speak to us, God. What is going on with Kenny right now? And now I'm bent over and I'm going, ah, oh, oh, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. So I had this wonderful love flowing through me, on me, over me, around me. And now I have this thing. And I'm just going like, what is happening? And Dick gets in front of me and Leo's over here and there's there's five or six of them now and they're just praying. They're praying in the spirit and they're just worshiping. The guitar is still playing. And Dick says, Kenny, I just heard the Lord say, lift your hands to him and he will deliver you. And I go, I can't. I literally could not, I could not, I could not even do this. I, I couldn't lift up. I am being attacked by a demonic spirit. And he and so they're going, ah, and they're, they're just worshiping. And all of a sudden he goes, I just heard the Lord say for me to put my hands underneath your elbows and assist you. And Ken, he put his elbows, his hand on my elbow. And as soon as he touched me, it went whoosh. And Ken, I explained to you that I was experiencing this, 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 this waves of love. It was multiplied uh, uh, 10 times, uh, 50 times, 100 times. And it, it, I, it, Holy Spirit just, it was like water. It was like, 
it was like water just ran through my the top of my head and went whoosh. And I felt this way, this, this, like the wave of water just go in me all the way down to my toes. And it began to fill me up and like, I could hardly take it. And all I could do, all I could do was go, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, I love you. Oh, God, I love you. Oh, God. And I could hardly talk. And I was just. And I'm, I'm just bent over. I'm so weighted down with this love and this freedom that just hit me. Oh, and you know what? He got this word. He said, "It's there's a fear of man over you. And God told me to lift your, el mm. lift your elbows up. And, and, the, and that spirit of a fear of man, you're more concerned or you're overly concerned about men and people, what they think. And I'm telling you, Ken, it left. That spirit left me. And Ken, I've never been the same. My, mm. my, my heart for Jesus grew. My desire for uh, my desire for the for the things of God. My, my, my desire for my heart, everything changed. And so I go now I leave and I go back to this little tiny church of a hundred people. Now what do I do? So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't start. I didn't, the last thing I'm going to mention is the the I the T word. That was the one that really gets people tongues, right? <laughs> so I never mentioned that. I never mentioned it. I and I wasn't praying in tongues. I was not doing that. Mm -hmm. But things changed. I Entities started showing up, challenging me. I, we had demons, and, oh, this may sound crazy, entering into the building. I'd be in my little office, which was all the way forward. Look at, think of a little church, you know, uh, hardwood floors, you know, old barn board floors, you know, old church, you know, like over a hundred year old church, the white, you know, the bell, belfry and everything, you know, that little, in a little tiny town, that was me. Hmm. And I, there were, there were, I would hear people, you could always hear people open up the main door and, and they shut it, and then you, and they walk forward, you hear them clunk, 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 and they walk up on the platform, it had carpet up there, it was softer, and they'd knock on the door. Or my kids would come, we lived right next door in a parsonage, it was the quintessential parsonage, right? Hmm. And this one day I hear this, and no knock. I go like, come in, come in, and there's no knock. Things like that start happening. The, you, you, you would hear these footsteps in the church. I, got, I was brand new to this. Like, what in the world's going on? I knew it, I knew it wasn't of, of heaven, right? I knew it was some kind of an adversary of some sort going, something's going on. But I had no understanding. Anyway, uh, during that time, I began to then get, I began to see things in my inside. I would start seeing things. I didn't know what they were. Found out later, the scripture calls them words of knowledge. I would start getting things for people. I would start knowing the secrets of men and women in their hearts. Wow. And I'd start speaking that to them. And they'd say things like, I've never told anyone that. How do you know? And I go, I just, I just felt it. Now, today, with your vernacular, say, you know, I, I had a word from the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And and then, and then this this uh, a wonderful guy named Dwight, uh, part of our church, uh, I, I end up leaving because it, uh, one of the deacons, bless his heart, he just said, I know you're praying in tongues. And I go, I'm not, because I wasn't. I desired it. Oh, did I desire it, you know, but I, I wasn't. But he, here's what he equated an excitement for the Lord yeah. and this fervor, this fervor for the community and people, you have to be one of those tongue speakers. Mm -hmm. And I go, no. And he goes, you're lying. I go, I, I'm not lying. Why would I lie to you? I'm a, I, I'm not a liar. <laughs> well, we ended up resigning. The church was going to split because this, and I didn't want to see it split. And, People would say, you have the vote, Pastor. You can, uh, like, are you kidding me? Vote? I'm No, I'm, we, we resigned. Two years we resigned. Now I'm planting this church. Now I'm getting these words of knowledge. They just keep increasing, keep increasing. I'm starting to get dreams at night.
I never had dreams like this. I'd get these, what are they? Now I call them prophetic dreams where God gives you dreams about people or events or places and things. And oh, just the Bible starts making sense, right? It's like, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And so I remember at Eastern Oregon University uh, in LaGrande, Oregon, a wonderful guy named Dwight, and he was a professor of math. And I just went by to see him. We were doing a, we were doing a church plant. They, Why don't you plant this church? Okay, we did. So, uh, would you? Could I just pray, Dwight? Yeah, I pray. And all of a sudden, I get this word as clear as this right here: pyloric valve. And I go, Dwight, I, I'd never had it like this before. I'd never had it like like that specific. And I said, Dwight, I just got this this word, pyloric valve. And he goes, Oh. Pray for me. Okay. So I I had anatomy in college. So, but I had I had messed up my valves and in, in, in anatomy. I was thinking it was a heart valve when it's actually the valve that goes is right, goes down to your, you know, it goes down into here, into the tube and into your stomach. It's that valve right at the stomach. And it's what opens up like that to let food in and it closes up after you swallow. At, or after it goes down in there, it closes, it just automatically opens up. So you can go upside down, you can you can lay down, you know, you can do a headstand if you want, and nothing's going to come out of your stomach. Well, he said, so I prayed for him. I just said, in the name of Jesus, it just God just healed this pyloric valve. And so just very quick, very, very simple. And he called me a few days later and he says, Kenny, I slept laying down for the first time in five years. If I had to sleep in a chair for five years, for the first time in five years, I was able to lay down because I felt God heal me. I felt it inside of me while you're praying. Praise God. And so he said the pyloric valve. And I go, I thought that was a heart valve. He goes, no, it's it's above the stomach. I go, oh, that's right. The pyloric valve. Pyloric acid. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, Ken, I'm excited. This is, and I keep grabbing my Bible. This is, it's starting to sound now like this. This is fun. This is really fun. Yeah. And I don't just mean like it, 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 it's it's a special thing to do and it's an honorable thing to do. It's fun. It's really fun to pray for the sick mm. and see them healed. Well, that put me on a whole new journey, brother. And I, what do you do with that? Anyway, we end up, the church plant, I didn't know what I was doing. It didn't, it wasn't, it, it didn't feel like what was happening to me. You know, I was reading about the vineyard and I was, I was getting some tapes and it didn't, and I, I really liked what I was hearing. And, and I thought, that's my DNA, what's happened in the vineyard. But these guys were trying to make me into their own thing. You know, we had, we had people from, I won't say the denominations, but this denomination, and that denomination, this denomination, this movement, and they wanted me to be that guy. And I just, I was just me, you know, was end up being that vineyard kind of a guy. Now Bethel is kind of that line of thing, you know, that was just me. I was very casual. I was, you know, not swinging from the chandeliers and not yelling and screaming and, and not changing my voice and preaching in a certain way. Uh, and I, I was just me with this added portion of this infilling of the Holy Spirit. So everything changed. So that's it. Man, you got a mouthful there. That, that's, that's, so that was my, you know, my beginning years. Hmm. And uh, ended up moving to Boise. Um, we were in the Grand Oregon, moved to Boise. We, we, we heard there was a vineyard over here. I came to visit by myself. I went back home and I said, man, it's good to my wife. Let's move. I mean, we just moved. We had no money. We just moved. It's not a huge move, but it's a it's a four-hour four hour deal. And we moved into Idaho, never lived in Idaho, you know. And our our pastor, Tri Robinson, was was part of the vineyard uh, uh leadership uh nationally with uh, on the on the council with with john wimber and so he was very close and so we just did i didn't realize what it was but it was just vineyard stuff and that's just what we did and so we would just we would always see people healed 
people be healed, demons leave, people emotionally healed, gay couples, lesbian couples encounter Jesus and and, and, and go, we can't do this anymore. You, know, you just start to see all this stuff happen and you're going like all in such love without being preachy and religious. And I thought, this is me. So then, uh, I mean, fast forwarding uh, without a lot of other stuff in between, I end up, uh, I said I, I didn't fit very well. I, I just never fit, the, I never fit that, that that what that pastor mode very well because of the descriptions that I've done. Pastors don't do that. I mean, we had you know the the pastor in our area, a great guy, but we we would do our little uh, uh, meetings like uh, geographical meetings, you know, of all the Baptist churches in that in that denomination. We get together and you know we hear things about like dressing for success and doing this and that, and you know, I just like I just. Works of the flesh. Yeah. No. We we live in a community where people wear cowboy boots and and they got they got cow manure on their on their pants from from working cows and and I and I come from that background myself so I would go work cows with people and I'd would you know I'd ride you know, I'd ride a horse you know and and I, I just I was with the people right I was doing what the people do and so dressing for success I mean I just wore my Wranglers and boots and that's just me right and. And I was a coach also by, by trade. And so I volunteered coaching at the, at the school that was right across the street from us and just loving people. Right. Anyway, so fast forwarding, I ended up moving, moving, or I was, we were here in Boise and then I, I thought, and I had just odd jobs, you know, odd jobs, odd jobs, not, not church related or ministry related, you know, always though, I always brought the kingdom. And I, I thought, well, I was a teacher by trade and I'd taught for a couple of years before I went to seminary there's a Christian school here. Our daughter was going to, there's an opening. Why don't I just apply? And I got the job. I, I love that. And switching school to a much bigger school here and, and had, had uh, 12 wonderful years with that school. And we coached, you know, coach track and basketball, won state championships in basketball. It was so good. And Ken, I would, <laughs> I would do the kingdom in my classroom, very conservative school came out of a church. I mean, there are 100 denominations represented, but it came out of this yeah. one very conservative place. But I'd bring the kingdom. I just like always bring the kingdom. I just want to always bring the kingdom. So I did. And uh, there would be kids that would get healed in my class. There were kids that would, the Holy Spirit would come and fill them in my classroom. And I came close to getting fired, you know, and <laughs> and that's just always been me. So while we're at the school, we're coaching everything, we thought, I had been saying for a number of years, let's take our kids on a mission trip. We need to get our kids outside of America, preferably not just across the border into Tijuana, you know, on the other side of San Diego. Why don't we, let's get them out there in the world. Long story short, we end up in the Philippines. A very good friend of mine, Brad Carr, who was uh, the, one of the coaches and uh, my administrative guy above me, my principal. And we went to the Philippines and uh, did these basketball camps. We worked with a local church in the slums, you know, and used a basketball for the glory of God. And then the next year we took a volleyball and we took, I took girls and, you know, used that white volleyball for the glory of Jesus, right, to touch people. Uh, and I, that was 2007 and 2008, in 2008, I come back after that trip. It was Christmas time. And I was at my computer. Kids were all in bed. My wife was in bed. And I was on my laptop, sitting right on my lap, just, you know, looking just like this here. And, and this little pop-up came up. And it said, sex trafficking or the sex trade, one of the two. And I clicked on it, and I began to read about the sex trade. And in a few moments, I began tearing up and going like, See, I feel it now. See, I, I've asked God to keep me soft, Ken, and I'm telling you, it's such a good prayer. God, keep me soft, or make me soft if you're hard, right? And so I, uh, 
I began to click and click and it was in the world and it went to Southeast Asia. And I clicked some more, it went to the Philippines and I clicked and went to Manila and I go, I've been to Manila and it was everywhere. And I go, it's, it's, it's like, I've been here for two, two, I'm on two trips now over the past two summers. I didn't see it. And Ken, I look down at my computer, my laptop, and there's tears. There were physical tears on my laptop. And uh, wouldn't you know, the Lord would later on tell me to name it, wipe every tear. He, he specifically said, name it, wipe every tear. And that's how I started with tears on my laptop. And Ken, I was reading things that I couldn't believe. You know, um, I'll just grab an object. I understand how you you could you could traffic a phone. You, 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 or you back in the back in the sixties they were trafficking blue jeans to the then Soviet Union. They they they'd pay ten bucks for them here and they'd sell them for a hundred bucks there, right? Or two hundred bucks. The stories were incredible. What people would pay for a pair of blue jeans? They didn't allow blue jeans. Communism. They don't allow that. You all look the same. And I understand how you can traffic drugs and bullets and guns and Kool-Aid or whatever it is. You, 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 you take this object and you take it from here and you bring it to there. And my spirit could not understand. I was sitting there going, but how do you traffic a person? How do you traffic a girl, a woman? I had no grid for it. That was 2008. That put me on a journey, 2008, 9, 10. We took trips in 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 2000, two more trips. And then moving up to 2011, it was time to go again. And I had been reading about the sex trade and we're gonna, it's time for a volleyball trip. And I just told my girls, high school kids, I said, you know, they're hearing these stories for the last three years, all these kids in the school about trafficking. I just, you know, I mean, it's a Christian, it's a Christian high school. And so, you know, let's talk about kingdom things. And they would be touched. Some, some of these kids in class would start tearing up, you know, because I'd be telling them what I've been reading, you know, never experienced it. And I said, why don't, it was, they're always two week trips. We'd go to, we'd go out to a camp. The church would recruit these kids in the community into their teens um, we take them out to a camp like we have in America. We do a basketball camp, and we, you know, like like they do right in America, and very intense. And so it was volleyball, and I said, well, and then the next week we would go back into the community and work with the church, and we go, you know, go visit the kids and everything, and throw a banquet for their families or anything. So we did all of that, but we didn't stay the full week. I said, let's, why don't we, why don't we take the second week? The Lord was telling me, take the second week and go look for the sex trade. You know, so people ask, like, how did you get into this? And you're saying, hey, tell before we even started, you said it would just tell us the whole schmeal. And so with high school kids and a few alumni who are now college kids, but it was mostly high school kids, and we had a few parents on board, we went and looked for the sex trade. And we found it. And uh, it was nothing like I would later see. This was very, very small. But I was broken. Going back, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. I was shaking. I was sobbing. Seeing these girls. So we were staying in this place that that actually had a ministry for uh, for traffic girls. Met this gal named Becky Becky Angelis. She was the director of that. Met her. She ended up resigning later on, and she ended up. I offered her a job after she resigned, and she's my my director to this day, and she is an amazing woman. And so her and I, from the, I asked her, I said, what, what's your greatest need? And she said, these girls need to go to college. And I knew because we were already, I had already started Wipe Every Tear in 2008. And we were just helping the poor in Manila. 
you know, just raise a little bit of money, you know, and we just, we're helping, you know, just the small groups of people. And I, uh, which Ken, by the way, we, we, we took these trips and on that trip, we would, I, I told the kids, don't bring a suitcase, bring a backpack. And, and so there was, cause the Lord was speaking to me about, he said, I want you to go buy food, go buy rice and noodles and canned sardines, go buy all this stuff and work with the local, the local church there. And then just go feed the poor. I, I've never done that in my life. I, I've had a, you know, world vision kid, but I've never, I've never gone into the slums. And, and so we emptied out our backpacks. Okay. Tomorrow guys, we're going to go, we're going to buy, we're going to, and Ken, we went to these markets and bought sack after sack after sack of rice, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of rice and split it up, put it in our backpacks and then went door to door to the, to the poorest of the poor. And Ken, I started to understand why it's everywhere in here about the poor and about taking care of the poor and about feeding the poor. I didn't get it until then. And I started to feel the God, God's heart like never before. And going back to Becky, Angelus, I asked her, what, what's, what's the greatest need? And she said, they need to go to college. They all call me coach. She said, coach. And I knew this because we were, su we were, we were supporting the girl, Karen, Karen Grahalis, a dear girl and dear family. And I said, uh, I, I understand because we were supporting her. And that in the Philippines, if you don't have a college degree, you can't work at McDonald's. You can't sell peanuts. In a, and I'm not exaggerating. You can't sell peanuts in a little kiosk inside of a mall. You have to have a college degree. So poverty, poverty is, there's so much poverty. And these these kids, these, these, these people, adults, they can't go to school. They don't, they don't have enough to eat. How am I ever going to go to college? So Becky says, they need to go to school. And I go, okay, all right. So three days later, I didn't say much. I said, okay. Three days later, I talked to the people on my team. We had some parents. Three days later, I got four sponsors for four girls that were in this ministry that were that were there serving us, cooking our meals and whatnot. We got a scholarship for each of those four girls. And I'm telling you, we, we, we took, one, I remember that one of these girls, we'll call her name Betty. We never use her real name, but Betty and we brought him into this room. They thought they were in trouble. No, you're not in trouble. We brought him in with their sponsors. I remember there was a couple. And uh, we start talking to her. And we said, we have a sponsor for you to go to college. He said, I'd like you to meet your sponsors. Brett and Melody. And she just starts sobbing, just bawling. <laughs> Because it was just, it's not, it's not realistic. And that girl and the other three girls that were there, three of the four graduated. The one, Betty, ended up marrying a guy and is doing great. They encountered Jesus and, and they're all employed. They all are employed. And so that's how it all began. I just said, God, I... I, I said in the early days, God, if I could just help one girl, if I could just help one girl. And in a little bit of a rewind, I came back after that one trip when the Lord was speaking to me about early in the early years. And one morning he woke me up about 4.30, like in the middle of July, and in those hot July days. And I heard his voice say, name it, wipe every tear. And he said, go get a website. So I went, I bought a website wipeeverytear.org and he said and then the next day he says go by wipeeverytear.com you'll need that also <laughs> so i bought i had no i didn't know how you, i had to go i had to log on how do you buy a website you know we had no money my kids had a jar if we were in my office 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 around my home office here uh, there's a jar i st i have still have and people put a picture of this camp where the lord spoke to me about 
wipe every tear, like church camp place where we did the basketball and volleyball camps. And and just God said, I just want you to begin with this one girl. There's this one girl in front of me. He says, just begin wiping her tears as she's crying. Wow. She's crying. So I'm up there and I'm, I'm wiping her tears away like this. As he said, wipe every tear. And he spoke to me and he said, you know. He said it like a coach, like a coach to a coach. You know how God speaks your language. And he and it was like, he put his arm around me. And he said, you know, like pat my back like this here. You know I'm going to wipe every tear on my side. You know, like, 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 like we know each other pretty well. You know I'm going to wipe every tear on my side. Now I want you to start wiping tears on your side and begin with her, this girl. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. That's how it all began. Just I, this is no goal, no objective. I really didn't want to do this. I was I wanted to teach and coach for really into my old old age, and bring the kingdom of God in the classroom. So we did start with one girl. She wasn't sex trafficked. She just needed to eat. She had twenty seven cavities. God said, "Take care of her." Twenty seven cavities later, twenty seven fillings later, and two or three extractions, she wrote back via the pastor, and she says, "Dear Coach Kenny, all my pain is gone." Revelation 21, 4, he'll wipe every tear. There'll be no more crying, no more pain, no more, no, no more sorrow. He'll wipe every tear. And that's how we began. And we just, you got to surely have a question. Yes. Well, wow. That's, I'm losing me kind of speechless. That's just spirit and on it. <laughs> how did you get connected to Becky? Your, uh, I guess it's okay to use that name. Uh, how did you get connected to Becky, your director? How was she called into the ministry? And and tell us a little bit about her and how she's you know the, your director there now uh, with the with the girls. Uh, that's one of the best questions you could ask. So it was 2011 when I took these that volleyball trip. But rewind the following year, 2010, we were doing a basketball trip. And one of my, two of the kids we were now married. The guy was on our first trip. The girl was on our volleyball trip the second year. A few years later, they get married. They're on this trip as a couple, a basketball trip. And they were going to stay behind. Alex and Colleen Canfield. Still live here in the area. I see him every once in a while. They're very good. He teaches at, at Coal Valley Christian, the, the school that I taught at. And they were going to stay behind and help this church for three, four, five months. And I had been sharing with them here in Boise, you know, you chat, you talk, you know, we're teaching together and about the sex trade. And they were being very touched by the sex trade. So... It was their last day, and they said, okay, coach, what's our marching orders? And I said to them, Colleen, Alex, go find the sex trade. This is before we had, now I'm going, I've re rewind a little bit. This is before we had went and seen it personally. Go find the sex trade and find us a place where we can stay, an alternative place to where we can stay. Find us a guest house. Don't want to stay in a hotel. I want to find a guest house. Go find us a guest house. Aye, aye, coach. They come across this wonderful ministry called Samaritana. And that's where Becky was working. And fast forward now to 2011, we go the next year. She was the director of that. They had a few rooms. We stayed there for a good week or more. Or Part of part of two weeks actually. I, I I'm going back to the conversation. I'm sitting at a table with her, and uh, I said, you know, what's your greatest need? And that's when she said they need to go to college. And so, shorten this up. She ended up resigning from Samaritana, 
And I, she wrote us afterwards she, and I got this email says, I'm resigning. I remember crying going like, I have this connection to the sex trade. Now it's gone. I mean, right now, think about it. If you want to go like, hey, I just want to go find someone that's involved in the sex trade. It's I mean, easier today with the internet the way it is and whatnot, but like trying to find someone in the sex trade like that has a ministry in that, like, uh, and she was leaving that. Like, uh, I, I was distraught. No, I'm going back to teaching in the, in the college. She's a college professor of business. And I asked her, I, I said, Becky, we, we were Skyping back then. And I said, Becky, uh, Actually, my wife says, let's offer her a job. My lovely bride, DA, I wish she was here. I wish I could bring her in right here. And she 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 would never do that. But she's a lovely lady. And she said, well, let's let's hire Becky. And I go, what? I'm a teacher in a Christian high school. She's a, a homeschooling stay-at-home mom. And we have a business on the side, a cleaning business. I mean, it's, you know, it was, it was rough back in those days. And... I go, how are we going to do this? And she goes, my bride, Ken, said, we'll eat beans and rice. That's how we'll pay Becky. We're going to offer her a job. We're going to pay Becky. Okay. So I offer Becky a job. She refuses. I said, Becky, I don't want to hear from you for the next 10 days. You fast and pray. I'm going back to the college classroom, coach. Okay. 10 days later, I get an email. She says, dear coach, greetings, da, 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 da. Much to my surprise, God told me to take you up on your offer. And then I was like, oh, God. <laughs> Praise I the mean, Lord. I mean, we don't have a business where, you know, you can you can sell more things to pay for her salary, right? We're, 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 we're I'm a school teacher, again, less salary than the public schools and, you know, six children and how we can do this. And she said, I don't need any money. I go, no, you have to have money. So we started paying her. I, I, I just asked her recently, what did we start? And I forget, but it was like less than $200 a month. It was nothing. And Ken, I'm here to tell you that, you know, John Wimber used to say this, here's how you spell faith. R I S K mm -hmm. risk. And I, and you know, and I've been a risk taker. I, I've just, ever since those early vineyard days, I just started taking risk. And so we just took risk. And, and, and by the way, my wife, right after that, be, be, okay, Becky says, okay, I'll do this. Like, what do you, how do you do? I, I don't, I'm not a business guy. I don't know how to do this. I mean, you're going to, I have, I have zero idea how to even begin this thing. But you know, if I, if I could rescue one girl, I knew there'd be great satisfaction. If one man and one wife could rescue one girl from the sex trade. Oh, if that were my daughter, oh my. And so Becky says, yes. And then now my wife says, well, we need to get a safe house. And I said the same thing. How are we going to get a safe house? And she goes, more beans and rice. And by the way, Ken, we didn't have to resort to beans and rice. Now, we didn't eat extravagantly. But, I mean, we did eat a lot of beans and rice, but we didn't have to go solely beans and rice. And I just put money in that jar that these kids put on my desk. And there. And I remember the first day that the, it, there was a $20 bill in there. And I'm like, a 20, I'm looking at my, a $20 bill. And then one day I, rem I, I remember I was up front, you know, and I, it was the, my desk was in the back. I go walking back and there's this thing. It looks like a check that's been folded up four times. So it's about, you know, like that. And I, and the bell rings and I, you know, they all go and I, I get in there, I look at it and there's a check for a hundred dollars. And I'm telling you that same God that was providing then is our still provision now. Now it costs us over $40,000 a month to do this thing. I mean, that's not huge compared to, you know, whatever, but it's still 40 grand, right? I mean, no. and we, and by the way, we don't ask for money. It just, it, God just brings it in every month. He brings it in. And so DA, my wife says, let's, let's get a house. And I'm going, oh, God. 
And I'm telling you, in those two, two decisions to hire Becky and to get a house, the roles were re reversed for some reason. I do not know why, but it was just like this because I'm the pioneer. I'm the go-getter. She's quiet. And all of a sudden she's saying, let's hire Becky. Let's get a safe house in the name of Jesus. And I'm going, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. We did it. We ended up getting the house. We rented it. We rented, rent, rent, you know, rent, rent, rent houses. The story on that whole thing is, I mean, I could tell you one story. We could be here for hours. Like of this house that we got and this, we didn't want this house. And this woman, she starts, briefly, This we're visiting the woman next door is the kind of the landlord for the people that own this house that live in the UK. And we went to look at it and it was all, rainy and it was raining and it was the house was leaking and there was standing water on the three floors and it's coming down the stairs and i said no no thank you no thank you and this little i mean little tiny old filipina grandma they call them lolas this lola grandma i start walking out and she she gets up and she starts dancing around the room this really happened. Dancing around the room. She has no idea that we're a, a, a Jesus people or anything like that. She starts raising her hand. No, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I know God wants you here. He's saying to me, he wants you here. He wants you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we walked out. No. We're not going to get that place. Three months later, Becky gets a call from the, from the owners in the UK and said, your house is ready. Mm. And it was for nothing. It was just a pittance. Uh, uh, this really nice house. They painted it. It was just beautiful. It's called the Hope House. So Kim, with one story after another, the manifest presence of God's heart for the poor and the broken and the trafficked. So that's how I found Becky and me, you know, we, we, we just, and, and we had nothing. We got the house. She, she's on her laptop and they put this little stick in there to get a little cell tower. And one of our girls, Betty, the girl I talked to you about earlier, she was our first girl. And she, is walking around and, and showing me the house and we have not, it's a, t it's all tile, you know, on the floor. There's nothing, there's nothing. There's no furniture. There's no, there's no nothing. Just a little tiny mat that you roll up and they were sleeping. I go, well, where does, I, where does Becky sleep? And she goes, well, we sleep here together. And I went, Beck, it's, it's not a spongy mat. It's one of those, those little things, you know, you roll, you know, it's just hard yeah. as a rock. This, this was, Becky was a woman. She was an educated woman. She was in line to be the dean of business, the school of business in this very nice university. She said no to all of that. And she's sleeping on a floor. We don't have a rice cooker. We don't have a bowl, a spoon. We don't have a fork. We don't have a knife. We don't have any glasses to drink out of. We had nothing. And she goes, Coach, do you think we could get there's we end up having these, we end up getting these four girls. Four or five. Could we get five plates? And then could we get one extra just to have in case someone else is there? Mm -hmm. That's how we start. I, I go, I yeah, I yeah, I'll see if I have the money. You go in the jar, you pull it out, you know, 27, 38 dollars, 40, 45. Okay, yeah. Can we get a rice cooker? Oh, let me see if I can get a rice cooker. You know, I'd go in the jar because the jar every day, people put the kids put their quarters and nickels and dimes. And that's how we started. That's how Becky started, a professional woman. And she's there to this day. Becky, when you see this, only God could do that, Becky. It's an amazing story, Ken. And you're missing a lot of the nuances, a lot of the stuff in between, but God brought her to my wife and myself. Hmm. So when you, you're taking teams in now, you have teams that actually you set up a, a time frame. Of, was it a week, two weeks that you go on a trip? Yes. When, when you get there, 
what is the, cause you're going into strip clubs, correct? Yes. You're going into strip clubs. So what is the preparation for the men you're taking into these strip clubs? How do you prepare spiritually to go in and, uh, yeah. You know, let the Holy Spirit work through you to uh, minister mm-hmm. to these girls working in the sex trade. Hey, don't let me forget that, I, but I need to rewind a little bit to explain uh, to those that are watching and listening to this, is that we can't go into the Filipino citizens, cannot go into these bars in a place called Angela City, the city yes. of angels. Mm-hmm. They can't go into the bars. Because these bars cater only to foreigners. It's the sex trade. It's 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 sex tourism. Think about that. So we are um, an agency, an organization, a ministry that requ- it's mandatory that men and women get on airplanes from wherever they're at in the world to come and descend upon the Philippines. Because now they're foreigners and we go out in teams very briefly we go out in teams to go out into these bars and we split up and we take some our filipina staff and some our girls some of our girls that are come from the bars they go back into these bars oh it's amazing and they love going back in and in their words they say i want to go back and get my sisters so those of you who are watching we need you and I guess maybe this would be an opportune time before I answer your question. Uh, four and a half years ago, we did a man team. Men only. Uh, uh, uh. Like, wait, you can't take men. You can't take men in the sex trade. That's what many, many voices were saying. But the Lord told me, and he said, I want you to take men and men only on purpose because it's men who are doing the violating. It's men who are doing the exploitation. It's men who are doing the the raping, the abuse. You take men filled with the spirit of God. You take men and I want you, I want you to be carriers. This is his word. I want you to be carriers of revival and take it into those bars and that street and that city. <laughs> 